I'm Jerry Gardner, class of 58, life trustee of the university and father of Bradley Gardner, class of 1996. And I'm delighted to be hosting all of you this evening. It was the protesters last spring and summer that inspired university trustee Kathy Waller, Atlanta alumni network leader Carl Grant, and me to do something about the systemic racism that continues to plague our country. For too many years, we have given only lip service to the issues that our minority and disadvantaged communities have been dealing with for the past 400 years. We decided to reach out to our community leaders in Atlanta to learn more about the efforts that they and nonprofit organizations have been making for years. And we wanted to include our university alumni, parents, and friends living in the Atlanta area. So we developed Challenging Racism in Atlanta, a monthly program featuring these organizational leaders, the issues they are dealing with, and the programs and projects that they have developed to deal with the impact of systemic racism on housing, education, health care, homelessness, poverty, and the mass incar incarceration of young black men. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce to you David Jernigan, President and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Metro Atlanta. David entered nonprofit management after 20 years in K-12 education, most recently serving as Deputy Superintendent for Atlanta Public Schools, where he led the schools and academics division. Prior to assuming the role of Deputy Superintendent, David served as the executive director for KIPP Metro Atlanta, where he was responsible for growing the KIPP network from two to eight schools here in Metro Atlanta. As we begin this presentation, I want to encourage you to submit any questions you have through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. David? Great, thank you, Jerry. And it is such a pleasure to be with you all this evening. I've um, been looking forward to this conversation and thank you for your leadership, Jerry, and, and facilitating these conversations, which are so important. Um, I'm gonna take a minute and I'll pull up my slides here and uh, look forward to the opportunity to um, walk through a few of these with you today. And um, we'll then, after about 25 minutes or so, we'll turn to some questions. And I know there's, I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, what's on your mind as, as we talk about um, how the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta have tackled um, lots of different issues around uh, race and equity. Um, and certainly this year has been a learning journey for us. Um, as Jerry said, I've been in the seat of president and CEO. I've, I'm actually literally um, two days away from celebrating my one year anniversary. So um, I have um, learned a lot about this organization and, and look forward to sharing a little bit about the organization with you and, um, and, and the journey and the future direction which we're thinking about and, and really directing the organization. So this is an organization you're probably familiar with. If you've lived in Atlanta for very long, or frankly, if you've lived anywhere in the United States, you've likely heard of the Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta has been around for over 80 years, since 1938. Um, and it has been a part of that ecosystem that's really dedicated to ensuring uh, that children and teens can take advantage of every opportunity this great city has to offer. Um, and this is a great city. I don't have to tell folks who live here what an amazing place this is. Uh, just incredible opportunity thriving in so many ways. Um, and you know, you look at the film industry in Georgia, you look at technology companies in, in Atlanta, all of the HBCUs and universities here, what a great city it is to live in. Um, but it's also true and, and sadly the case that at the same time, really depending upon where you live in the city, people are having a very different experience in terms of prosperity and hope and access to opportunity. Um, there have been so many different studies that have indicated that Atlanta is one of the toughest places to grow up poor and one of the toughest places to ever get out of poverty if you were born into poverty. Um, and, and the income inequality here um, is certainly a challenge that um, so many people are trying to address. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's most people recognize that the, the pandemic has only exacerbated these inequities. Um, and so we think a lot about this as an organization with Boys and Girls Couples in Metro Atlanta. What we also think about is that these inequities are not just about adults. They hit kids in very real ways in terms of both academic outcomes of young people, 
food insecurity, I mean, even um, their physical well being. Um, and so we have existed as an organization uh, to try to address the, those opportunity gaps that youth across Metro Atlanta experience. I'm really pleased to share our new mission and vision statement with you. Uh, we spent a lot of time over the last uh, year thinking through our strategic plan and revisiting our mission and our vision. Um, and this really speaks to who we are as an organization. Uh, we believe that we exist to ignite the unlimited potential of kids and teens. Um, and, and we see just the, the strengths that they bring, the value that they have, um, their inherent intellect um, and beauty, and it's our job to bring it out of them. I mean, we do that by creating safe, inclusive, and engaging environments. And if there's anything we've learned this year is that those environments can be both physical environments as well as virtual environments. Our vision is about creating thousands of young leaders who are thriving in life personally. So they themselves, as they leave our clubs, are thriving and have every opportunity in life. But just as importantly, they are leaders in their community, that they are strengthening the futures of their own communities and strengthening the world. Um, and so we, we really see a world in which Boys and Girls Club of Metro Atlanta can help to develop thousands of young people to do this because of the footprint that we have in the Metro Atlanta area. So who do we serve? We have nearly 7,000 kids and teens each year. Uh, they range from age six to age 18. And you can see as we talk about race tonight, how many of our young people come from racially diverse backgrounds. A large majority of our kids are African-American. Um, about 7% identify as Hispanic. Um, and a large majority of our, of our um, kids come from what would be considered low-income households. Um, pretty good um, divide between um, boys and girls, but a, a slight um, tilt towards boys. Um, but what's really unique about this organization that I really love is that we serve kids from elementary through high school, and we have the opportunity to lean in and support families um, all the way from six to 18 years old, um, which is, I think, one of the unique things that we are, that we have as a youth development organization. So where do we uh, do our work here in Metro Atlanta? If you're familiar with the Metro Atlanta area, this map um, would, would be familiar to you. Uh, we have 23 clubs right now and, and growing. Um, and so what you'll see is a map that is the Child Wellbeing Index map provided by the United Way. And if you have ever seen this map before, what you know is that the United Way of Greater Atlanta identified a variety of factors through the lens of a child's well-being. Um, and they mapped out across Metro Atlanta where young people are thriving and where there are real challenges in terms of a child well-being index. And so our desire as we look to the future is to really be in those areas of orange and red where we think we can have the greatest impact. But today we're spread across 10 counties from Cherokee up north to Rockdale, all the way to Paulding County and down into Clayton now. Um, and so we are really excited to be able to have a footprint across Metro Atlanta um, but these seven clubs you see on the, on the side of the slide are some new clubs that are opening up as part of our new strategic plan. And you can see the concentration of them in the most impoverished areas of our city. We also have a year round residence camp um, that is uh, just uh, west of Athens. And, and it's a really exciting place for young people to grow and explore the outdoors and have the opportunity to get away for the summer. Um, and it is just an incredible place for us to develop young leaders. So how do we serve young people? You're probably familiar, if you've ever seen a Boys and Girls Club in your community, you're familiar with our standalone facilities. And those are sort of the bread and butter of Boys and Girls Clubs for so many years. But over time, the model has really evolved. And we have learned that we can reach young people in a variety of different places. And so while the majority of our clubs are traditional standalone club facilities, partnership sites are becoming more and more um, how we're going to expand our reach. We actually today have four clubs that are embedded within schools. Um, and we provide the after school program and out of school programming for kids in that school. You can imagine the advantages that provides us because kids don't have to get there. They're there right at the end of the school day. We also have three clubs in Atlanta that are part of a, a partnership with the Atlanta Police Foundation called the At Promise Centers. Um, and these are gonna be really important as we talk about the uh, relationship between law enforcement and our communities. Um, these clubs are um, embedded within community centers that provide a variety of wraparound supports to families. Um, and, and really, we are a critical part of providing that mentorship um, and the um, academic supports to young people in these particular at promise centers. We also have three clubs that are housed within community centers and rec centers. Our newest club we just opened in Clayton County, um, our Flint River Community uh, Boys and Girls Clubs. 
that's in an intergenerational community center um, where it's not a standalone facility again, but is housed within the, the context of a larger center that really allows our kids and families to access other resources, um, not just the standalone facility. And you can imagine this is an efficient way for us to think about how we might grow our footprint. So what happens in a club? And, and this is something for me that has been a, a real learning experience. As a former principal, I thought I knew all about the Boys and Girls Clubs because I had a strong partnership with the local Boys and Girls Clubs down the street. Uh, but I've learned a lot in this past year that I, I really, as an educator, never fully appreciated how much happens in a club. Um, this is our programmatic model. Um, and I'll start by saying if there's anything that I've grown to appreciate is that the Boys and Girls Clubs is really about relationships. We have the unique advantage of hiring full-time youth development professionals who facilitate programs in these three priority outcome areas. But those full-time professionals stay with us for years and in some cases decades and really have the opportunity to impact young people um, for, for really um, much of their childhood, uh, which is I think a unique thing about the Boys and Girls Clubs. But in terms of our academic model or our programmatic model, we have three core areas. The first is academic success. We wanna make sure that young people, when they come to us and they walk in our doors after school, uh, which is largely when we serve them, that immediately they have the supports to get their homework done. So we have a power hour. We have a summer brain game program that really is research-based and helps address summer slide. We have a variety of programs that really bring out and focus on the arts um, and spoken word and music um, and just a variety of ways that we can really help to support the academic success of our young people and ultimately to ensure that they graduate on time with a plan for their future. We also spend a lot of time working on character and leadership. I mean, this is where the social and emotional support for young people, helping them um, really develop as leaders and understand how to um, grow into their leadership uh, through a variety of programs, including our Keystone program, our Youth of the Year program, um, and our Torch Club program. We also have um, a real focus, this is, this is something that the Boys and Girls Club has been known for for years, around healthy lifestyles. That's more than just physical fitness. We do a lot of sports programs, um, focus a lot on our girls and making sure that they're active. Um, but we also have many partnerships that allow us to help our young people um, with making good life decisions, making good decisions about their sexual health, making good decisions about relationships, um, and, and also teaching them things like gardening and, and just understanding how to eat healthy. Um, so it's really the holistic approach to development that's, that's so critical. And all of this is underpinned by a, a college and career readiness strategy that focuses on helping to expose our young people. I mean, it really, it starts with exposure and then giving them practice opportunities and ultimately giving them experiences that by the time they leave us, the idea is that they ultimately will have a plan. And that is how we hold ourselves accountable. So what does that plan look like for some of our young people? Because they have been in our clubs for so long, they've gone on college tours. They've had support with their college application process. They've had support with navigating the scholarship application process. And they are set by the time they leave our club because of all the supports they've received in that space. Others have gone on field trips and experienced even internships with some of our corporate partners that is, have allowed them to understand the opportunities that exist um, out there that may allow them to go directly into the workforce. We have, for example, a great partnership um, in, in, um, with an organization locally that has allowed our young people to intern there. Um, it's MailChimp, and um, they have walked into jobs that are paying pretty lucrative salaries um, because of the internship experience that they've had. And, and two of them just recently um, signed on their first home and, and closed on their first home as a result of this internship that turned into just an incredible job opportunity. Um, so our role is really focused on helping them uh, to just find their path, whatever that path should be, and holding high expectations for them and helping them understand that they can achieve whatever their aspirations are and trying to give them the tools to do that. I wanted to share just a bit about how we have pivoted. So as every organization during this pandemic, uh, we had to immediately pivot when our doors were closed last March. Um, and we recognized that we were uniquely positioned because of the relationships we had with kids and families to lean in and support them in ways that were not traditionally part of our model. Um, we did meals and groceries with 120,000 meals um, over the course of a few months um, and to really just lean into the food insecurity that we knew so many of our families were experiencing. We did wellness checks, um, consistently checking on our kids when we couldn't see them in person and making sure that they were doing well um, and for some kids who didn't have devices, we were able to get out and get them a laptop 
so that they could log in and do the virtual instruction. We also created and stood up a virtual club experience um, over the course of the summer to just try to stay connected with young people, which was especially important when things, when the protests started happening last summer, uh, to create a space to connect and to give kids a, a chance to process what they were experiencing. As we've gone um, into this school year, we completely changed our model again. Uh, we recognized that most kids were going to be in virtual instruction, not coming to an after school program as the school year started. And so we opened up our club doors for the entire school day. Um, and we partnered with local districts and provided kids with a safe space to come, log on, do their virtual instruction, have caring adults around them that could support them, making sure that they were fed and making sure that they had some healthy outlets um, beyond just sitting at home, um, logging into virtual instruction. That model has evolved over time, um, but we've continued to have that availability for a lot of our families who have asked for it because it's been such an important part of just pivoting our approach to be there for our families over the course of this pandemic. Many folks often ask me, well, how are you guys funded? How are the Boys and Girls Club? How do you keep your doors open? We have a pretty diverse base of funding, but I will say it's important to understand that we charge very little for our, our, our kids to come to our club. On average, a kid would pay anywhere between $60 to $130 for a semester membership. And it's on a sliding scale based upon income. Um, if, if you've ever had to pay for after school care, you know that is um, quite, a, quite a deal. Um, but the way that we're able to do that is because we have a great deal of philanthropic support, which is largely um, the base of our, of our revenue streams. Um, it's a good, pretty good mix of government dollars to help support us. Our foundation community in the metro Atlanta area has been very generous. Um, and then corporations and individuals often support our efforts. Um, we see the individual and corporate space as an opportunity for us to strengthen our fundraising efforts as we move forward um, to try to further diversify our funding in the metro Atlanta area so we can continue to keep our doors open. So as we look to the future, as I mentioned, we just recently launched a new strategic plan that we're really excited about called RISE 2025. And I, I don't have time to go through all the details of that plan, but I'll highlight a couple of things about it. First, the overarching theme of our plan is more kids, more often, greater impact. This pandemic has really challenged us to think about how can we be there for more kids in Metro Atlanta? There are so many kids in this city that would benefit from a Boys and Girls Club type experience. And so we've challenged ourselves over the next five years to grow from 7,000 to 10,000. We know that that's gonna likely happen largely through partnerships that will allow us to deepen our impact in hiding communities um, and not try to do this alone, to do it really in partnership with our communities. Um, there's a pretty good balance in our plan of, of training and, and getting brilliant at the basics, but also expanding existing programming. So I mentioned our career bound program that's really right now high school focused. We're gonna be expanding that into elementary grades and, and middle grades and understanding we shouldn't be waiting until high school to start that important work. As I've mentioned, we wanna build out a more robust individual giving program and expand our corporate partnerships. And I'll share with you in just a moment, some of the work that we're doing around equity and inclusion um, and, and the board's commitment to building a more diverse board. Um, this has been a really important part of the, the journey we've been on over the past year. Um, but they have committed in our RISE 2025 plan that by 2025, 50% of our board members will come from racially diverse backgrounds, um, which is a significant um, increase from where we are today, uh, which is around 30% uh, for our corporate board. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that journey. So I've referenced this a few times um, and, and understanding the focus of tonight's conversation and the impetus for these sessions. I thought I would take a minute and just talk openly and, and very transparently about the journey that has been a humbling experience for us over the past year. Um, I recently um, published an, an op-ed that I'm happy to share in the chat later um, that um, really captures this journey in, in a lot more detail than what I'll probably have time to go into this evening. Um, but I'll start by saying as a white leader and a white male leader coming in to lead an organization that serves largely black and brown kids, um, it was not lost upon me coming in how important um, creating a space to have conversations around race and equity was going to be. I didn't fully appreciate until I got into the seat how challenging um, this topic was going to be for the organization and frankly how much pain um, so many people in our organization had experienced um, and the work that we had to do internally so that we could show up in a different way for our kids. Um, and so as I think about and reflected on all that we've learned as an organization, a few things come to mind under the theme of 
things that matter. And a lot has been said over this past year about Black Lives Mattering. And, and one of the thir first things that we decided to do after the George Floyd murder um, was we spent some time thinking about well, how do we wanna take a position on this? And I'll, I'll share with you that um, taking a position um, sounds easy at times, um, but when you have an understanding of your funder base and the diverse funders who keep your doors open, uh, you obviously have to be conscious of what that message is going to do and how it will land um, with various members of your audience. But we made a decision that we were going to come out and just say that we really embrace the notion that Black Lives Matter and that there's a reason that we need to embrace this. There's a historical context that our kids need to understand, even if they're not Black, why we believe that Black Lives Matter. And we you know, ultimately created t-shirts for our staff to wear. And it was a really small thing in the grand scheme of things, but it really was powerful for our kids to see. And, and as one of our board members said, the message you're sending is that you matter. Um, and, and we did take the risk that there were some funders who were going to assume that we were associating ourselves with what might, they might perceive to be a left-leaning organization that didn't and, you know, support law enforcement. But ultimately, we decided that what was most important is that we and tell our kids that they matter um, and that we help other kids who are not Black understand the historical context for why we have to clarify that um, and, and that we shouldn't have to, but that we have to clarify that. Um, and so that's been an important, you know, initial step. Obviously, that's that's a very small step, but an important one in our organization, and and one in an organization that we had not really grappled with issues of race very openly in the past. And so that's been part of our journey as well. Another thing that really surfaced early on is we started having conversations as a leadership team, and then really started bringing in our club directors. Is that our language matters? Um, I heard story after story and anecdote after anecdote of how the way we talk about our work, how it landed with certain communities um, and how it, it did not feel at times that it was coming from an assets-based perspective, um, that it was really from a deficit perspective. Um, and so it forced us to think about everything from our mission statement. So our mission statement used to speak to us saving kids' lives. And what we recognized is that that sent a message that said that we thought we alone didn't need the community, that we didn't value necessarily the support system that our young people had in the villages that they were a part of, and that we alone were positioning ourselves as their saviors. And, and you can imagine how that landed with certain communities, but the organization had just never talked about it. And so we decided to change our mission statement. And there were so many other examples of how, particularly as donor tours were happening in clubs, how we talked about kids in front of them, um, and some anecdotes that folks shared that we really recognize, guys, we've got to talk about this and understand that our language matters. Um, and so we're taking a, a, um, a deep look at everything that we have in writing. I mean, also just having some honest conversations with board members who, um, many of whom are on their own journey as all of us are of learning and understanding how they communicate and what the mindset is behind what you communicate and why it matters that you unpack what you might what it may mean about what you believe about a community if you say certain things about a community. So that's been part of the journey. Um, I'll also say that, you know, this is an organization like many nonprofits in Atlanta and likely beyond Atlanta, um, that if you were to look at the makeup of our staff, what you would find is that we have a largely African-American um, employee base in terms of those folks who are on the ground in the trenches every day doing the hard work in clubs, including our club directors. But when you go into the support center and you look at our senior leadership team, historically, it has been a very white senior leadership team. And then when you look at our board, as I mentioned before, it is also a very white and, and historically white male dominated board. Um, we really had to spend time with our board, with our leadership and unpacking why that mattered and why we had to work aggressively to bring more diverse voices around the table who had, a, had context around the experiences of our kids could help us make better decisions that were informed by their own experiences. Um, and, and that really um, required us to think about what it would mean as we built our leadership team and as we recruited new board members on how we had to be more intentional about it. And, it, and like all of these conversations, they weren't always easy conversations because it, it sort of immediately poses the question to those who are in the seats who might be well-meaning white leaders who have poured their heart and soul into this work um, at times feel undervalued and underappreciated and misunderstood. Um, and so that's been challenging um, to sort of navigate, and, but part of the journey and an important part of our journey. 
We've also learned that looking beyond the surface matters. Um, you know, we had the unique opportunity to partner with an organization called Elyria. Um, and this is a data-driven um, inclusion, inclusion focused organization. And they came in and they did an assessment with all of our employees. And the way they do their analysis is they ask every employee to share experiences and stories in the organization where they felt excluded. And then they sort of tracked those experiences and gave us sort of some data-driven um, uh, stories and, and trends that they saw in the data. And what we learned from that is that you know, we were looking for things on the surface. We were looking for trends by race. We were looking for things, you know, for trends by gender. What we found is that the trend actually was beyond that. And we had to sort of peel back the onion a few layers to understand that really the, the major area where we had to work on from an inclusion perspective in the organization was really for our part-time employees who did not feel that they were part of our family and really felt left out of so many decisions. And so that's the work we have moving forward now, there is a correlation between part-time employees and race in our organization, but it looks different in terms of our part-time employees. And so that's part of the work we have to do. We also learned through this and reinforced for us how much youth voice matters, that we can't be sitting around having conversations about our kids and about this work without encouraging and including them in the conversation. So we did a lot over the past year to bring them to the table to both help them process but help empower them too. They were hungry to do something. And so we gave them an opportunity. We gave them platforms to have their voices heard. Um, and you know, at times that has um, been challenging for some of our, our um, stakeholders. We have an annual Youth of the Year event. It's our annual gala. And we, this past year, because it was virtual, we decided this year we weren't going to do the standard approach where they give their speeches about how much the club has impacted them. There was part of that. We really said was, this is your platform. Talk about what matters to you. Talk about what you're passionate about. And as you can imagine during that time, so much came out from everything from, you know, their experience with law enforcement and criminal justice reform to LGBTQ issues, um, to a variety of matters that were a little controversial for some of our stakeholders, but we recognized that we needed to create that platform for them. And finally on this, I'll just say that the journey matters. Um, we have been on a journey. It's been inclusive. We have tried to listen more than speak um, and, and really take the time. It, it's not going to happen. The change is not going to happen in this organization or in this community overnight. Um, but we've really embraced the journey, and I think it's been healthy for us to embrace. So I'm going to wrap up here by just sharing a couple of more quick slides and just share with you that um, we are an organization that is led by a very, um, you know, it, diverse board and growing and more and more diverse. Um, but also a board that represents a variety of companies across Metro Atlanta and a variety of, um, of entities and organizations across Metro Atlanta. And you likely recognize some of these names and some of these companies. We also have a group of trustees that really serve as, a, as advisors to the organization um, and really are champions um, for us as an organization. And we also, within each of our counties, have a local board made up of 10 to 25 folks that support their local clubs and raise dollars to support their clubs. And we have a lot of champions. We have a lot of organizations, a lot of foundations, a lot of corporate uh, partners that help to, to keep our doors open every day. Um, and finally, I'll just share that we always are looking for folks to help. There are lots of ways if you, if any of tonight, what I've shared with you piques your interest and you wanna get involved with Boys and Girls of Metro Atlanta, this is an opportunity for you to, um, to think about how you might get involved and whether that's making a donation or getting involved in one of our boards or coming out and volunteering. Um, there are just so many different ways, and I'd be happy to um, engage anyone who has an interest in that. So that concludes my slides, um, and at this time, I would be happy to turn it back to Jerry and, and answer any questions that might have come through in the chat or any questions you may have, Jerry. David, what an impressive, I read your article, but your, your presentation tonight really emphasized the journey that you're taking and how important it is to get down deep into the issues that we all have to deal with. It's something we haven't been doing for, for too often. Mm -hmm. and we really appreciate all that you and your colleagues have been doing to continue to create safe and inclusive and engaging environments for our young people. And I thank all of you for your questions that uh, many of you have submitted. Um, and we're gonna spend a little time talking about uh, getting to those questions right now. Uh, there are a lot of organizations, David, that are doing great things for our kids in Metro Atlanta. What makes Boys and Girls Club different? 
Yeah, you know, a few things. One, I, and I've mentioned a couple. One is just the scale of the organization. There aren't many youth development organizations in Metro Atlanta that serve the number of kids that we're able to serve that are spread across 10 counties. Um, and there aren't many organizations, as I mentioned, that are able to serve young people from six to 18 years old. Um, I think the 80 plus year history is really an important part of our journey and, and allows us to really leverage the experience of 80 plus years in this work. A lot of research from our national organization, which is another thing that's really helped us. Uh, we have a national organization that brings a great deal of resources and support. Um, so we can continue to modify and refine our model um, to really be responsive to what the needs of our kids are. Um, and so I think those things combined, the scale, the age um, that we're able to support young people, the, the long history and the national affiliation, I think is one of the, a few of the things that really make us unique in Metro Atlanta. Jerry, I, I can't hear you. Yeah, now it's better. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think when you have your papers on the speaker, that okay. might be part of what's happening. That could yeah, be. Yeah, now you're good, right there. Perfect. Um, <laughs> young people, especially in racial minorities, are often, uh, often internalized messages about their race from a variety of places especially the media. What role do you believe Boys and Girls Club can play in helping a young person develop a positive sense of self, especially as it relates to race? Yeah, that's such an important question. And I think it's, it's huge what the Boys and Girls Clubs can do. Um, as you know, many times in schools, and I come from a K-12 background, I understand what it's like in a school setting where you are bound by the curriculum, you're bound by the standards, the standardized test. Frequently, Teachers don't take the time or they don't have the time to really address those other aspects of the developmental needs of young people. And particularly for a young person to understand their history, to understand the legacy of, of their people and to really learn more about who they are. And especially for black and brown children who are fed so many negative messages about their history and um, to really help ground them in who they are. And then surround them with, with leaders who are thriving in life um, we, we have an incredible opportunity through, you know, these enrichment experiences that we create for our kids, whether that's college field trips to HBCUs or whether that's um, exposing them to executives in Metro Atlanta um, who look like them and come from their same communities. is an opportunity to show a different image than perhaps what they are used to seeing on television or in their communities. And so we really try to, to take advantage of those opportunities. I'll also say that as we look to our future I think this past year has taught us that, you know, when, when we brought our young people together to process what they were experiencing after the protest took off, uh, what we recognize is that we've done a lot to support them, but we've got to be more intentional. We have to be more intentional in building out a strategy that addresses um, the programmatic aspects, that addresses the opportunities for us to just talk more openly about these issues and to equip our young people with the skills and knowledge they need to navigate all, you know, the world in which they live they, and, the, and, and frankly, a, a world where the odds are stacked against them. Um, and so the only way to do that is to have open and transparent conversations with them. And mm -hmm. it's the, I think the work that I mean, we have, we have the space to do it in a way that schools frequently don't. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, a question from one of our viewers, which may not be completely in your bailiwick, but it, certainly impacts what's happening in the world today, what's happening in certainly the United States uh, with all the abuse that the Asian Americans are getting. Uh, the questioner, can, can we discuss the detrimental effects of the idea of a model minority and how it can lead to gaslighting of specific groups, specifically Asians? Yeah. It's such a great question. And I will tell you, I am not a psychologist um, and not a, a, um, an expert on race theory or, or necessarily, and I certainly don't have the experience as an Asian American to speak to the impact of that. But it's, um, I think what for me that, that brings up is just how important it is to have diverse perspectives around your leadership table on your board that can highlight issues just like that. Um, because I, I will tell you, if you don't, as a white male, my lived experience doesn't allow me to even, frankly, provide a lot of rich commentary on that question. Um, yeah. 
but having people around me um, who can and who you know have lived experiences that can help shape how we talk to our kids about it. I will tell you when Atlanta experienced um, the tragedy recently um, in the Asian American community, one of my leaders on my team who was Asian American reached out and said, okay, we've got to come up with a plan. And, and we really empowered her to rally around with our DEI council, a strategy for how we talk to our kids about this and some of the misconceptions that they have around Asian Americans. Um, yeah. and we are, um, we've, we've had some, some really honest conversations about that, but, but I think you know, this is such a, a great example of why having diverse leadership is so important. Yeah, and it gets to the issue of, we don't really understand what some of the issues are of minorities. And we're talking minorities, we're also talking about Asians. And we think of the Asians as, you know, uh, 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 very positive, uh, but they are also experiencing um, difficulties uh, with, with uh, racism racism as well. Uh, you shared a bit about, and I was really impressed with your journey. You shared a bit about your organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. What's been the most challenging part of this journey so far, and how, how have you navigated those challenges? Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of things that come to mind for that. I mean, I'll, I guess I'll start by saying, um, we, and I think everybody on this call knows that we are operating in a world that has become more and more polarized. Um, and, and the idea that a pandemic has become political, um, I think speaks to just sort of how polarized we have become. Issues yeah. of race and equity have also become incredibly political. And, and the protest um, that happened this summer, depending upon your political perspective, you view the world in, in many very different ways. And, and I think one of the things that was challenging for us is recognizing that we operate in 10 counties in Metro Atlanta. And if you go into Fulton County today and you look at what's happening in our clubs and how people are experiencing the pandemic, it looks and feels very different than in Cherokee County and how people think we should be handling issues of race and equity, especially look and feel very different from county to county across Metro Atlanta. And so because we have such a diverse group of funders and supporters, understanding how we navigate this in a way that, you know, is authentic and honest, but also doesn't polarize any of our supporters. That was challenging. And, and frankly, I think we came to a place where we recognize we just have to speak truth. And, and all we can do is be authentic and be honest. Um, and if people don't like that we are standing up for what's right and standing for equity and standing for up for our kids and communities, then they're probably not funders we needed. Um, and so that's, but that's not always easy to do. Um, you know, I'll also share that I think particularly when you're thinking about the messages you're sending out about your kids and your communities. One of the things that nonprofits are, are, I don't think are very honest about this sometimes, but the truth is there is a temptation in this work to oversell and overstate the impact that you have. And, and the, I think the negative impact of that is that you minimize the importance of family. You minimize the importance of all the other stakeholders in the community, the churches, the other agencies, by trying to position yourself as a nonprofit in order to get donor dollars as the thing, the solution. And there's just a lack of humility in that, that and, and lack of just honesty. Um, but I think it's so tempting to do when you're seeking dollars. But I think it, in, in this world of like really understanding how your message lands and how you talk about this work in, in a way that, that really honors your communities and honors your kids, that hasn't been easy to navigate internally. And, and particularly for those, you know, I have board members who've been in this work for 20 years with us. I have folks in my resource development team who really struggled when they started hearing how some of their messages were landing. And they, and they know, and, and you know, you know, they're coming from a place of wanting to help. They have a pure heart, but they just don't understand. Um, and so that's been challenging to navigate for people who are such champions for this work, who, who you know, they're, they got a little defensive as we were having some of these conversations. And, and, you know, so I just tried to create the space for people to listen, create the space for folks to lean in and just try to learn um, and I think the more that you can create the safe space to do that, and that's, you know, we haven't figured it out yet, but I think we're more and more chipping away at that. Yeah, yeah. and let them know how important it is to listen, how important right. it is to get the information. 
Um, right. I was very impressed with your uh, your approach to uh, your having to deal with members of the board and uh, what their reaction would be. I can certainly understand how I would feel if I had been on a similar board and all of a sudden the leadership said, uh, let's take a look <laughs> at what's really going on here. I mean, you're really getting down on the nitty gritty, which I think is so important, which people like me who have been living in this white privilege bubble for all these years and haven't really gotten to know what the issues are. You guys are really getting down to the nitty gritty of the of the issues and, and what's going on. What how have your uh, how how have your board members and leadership members uh, responded to, to your desire to get down to the nitty gritty? And many of them want to get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, it's been so fascinating, especially as a brand new leader. I mean, I I was trying to form relationships with our board members who were also our donors, right? So you rely heavily on your sure. board to you know support the organization. Um, and trying to build relationships while at the same time challenging them to, to dig deep and to have some conversations they've never had as a, as a board. Mm -hmm. um, and it was hard. And, and I've had several white male leaders on my board reach out and say, David, I just don't get it. I thought we were doing, like, we've been doing racial equity work before it was cool. Like, we, we're serving Black kids. We're doing great work for kids. Help me understand it. And then I really appreciated those opportunities because it it spoke to a desire to authentically learn and listen. Um, and frankly, even my board chair, who I have a lot of respect for as a white male, you know, we together, white males leading this organization. Um, he's had some moments where he has just said, I don't get it. And very vulnerable with in front of board members, um, really asking probing questions. Um, and, and, you know, we had one really powerful moment where he was working to set some new standards for board membership. And I don't think had fully understood what those new standards might do from the perspective of trying to build a diverse board. And one of our yeah. black members sort of stood up in that moment and said, I want you to think about this through this lens. When you do these three things, you may never know that as a black leader in this community, I will never want to join your board. And I'll never tell you why, but because of these actions you're about to take and to my African-American board members, you know, credit, he had the courage to say that in that moment, I think, because we had created this space and started having these conversations. But to my white male board uh, leader, uh, credit, he really listened and said, you know, I never thought about it that way. Thank you so yeah. much for pushing yeah. me. And to me, that's exactly what you want and need in an organization to, to continue to improve. Those are the kinds of discussions we've got to have, and, and so many of us are afraid to have them. That's and right. I'm grateful to your board chair for his willingness to say, David, I don't, I don't get it. And he's yeah. willing to listen <laughs> to your yes, to the black board member who said, here are the issues. If yes. you don't understand them, here's what, it, and too often we don't have those discussions. So that's right. And I, I was also impressed in your journey that uh, 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 the emphasis you put on youth and mm -hmm. getting their message across, because too often, we treat youth, let me see how I can put this. We treat youth the way those of us who are interested in trying to improve the black community treat blacks. Mm -hmm. We think youth, well, you know, you don't, you don't really know that much. You don't really care them, but they have so many messages and, and they come out with messages like your black board member came out with at the, the at your at your board meeting. Tell yeah. us more about uh, your involvement with uh, with youth. Yeah, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do when I joined the organization is just I went on a bit of a listening tour, and I it was important to me to have some focus groups with some of our young people and to just ask them about their experiences. Um, and you know what you when you learn when you listen is that they, as you said, they have incredible amount of wisdom, um, and I think what so often we do, and, and I, I charged my team this year as they prepared for our annual Youth of the Year event, I said, please don't censor them. I know we try really hard to make them appear polished, again, for fundraising purposes. And, you know, there's an element of like rehearsing and, and refining your speech that's important. Um, but we allowed a space for some controversial topics to come up at a, and, and in a way that I think um, 
was what's hard for some of our folks who have been around for a while and, and in some ways didn't make us look great. So particularly a young person who shared his experience as a, as a queer black male in one of our clubs um, and how he didn't feel that we had created an inclusive environment for him initially and the work that he had to do to feel included um, and, and ultimately the success that we had in getting there with him. Um, but it just spoke to the work that we have to do as an organization to train around issues around particularly sexuality and helping our employees understand how to navigate those conversations. Yeah. Didn't make us look great, but it was an important thing for us to highlight. Um, and, you know, I just, we've tried to just be transparent and vulnerable, um, which is not always comfortable and you're not always rewarded for it. But I think it's the only way I know to lead. And I think it's the only way the organization yeah. gets better over time. Why is it so important that we look great as opposed to being effective? in what we're doing. Um, you mentioned yeah. early on, you mentioned early on about relationships. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt that the success in anything you do is going to be developed, is going to depend upon relationships, the relationships mm -hmm. you develop with your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, your vendors, your, your, your customers, and so forth and so on. And your discussion of your work with your youngsters, with listening to youngsters, you are developing a relationship with them that few organizations, a few youngsters really experience with older people. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, you know, I was talking to one of our longtime supporters recently, and she said to me, David, people don't understand the secret sauce of Boys and Girls Clubs. It's like, tell me what it is. And she said, it's the relationships that our adults develop with their kids. And I do think back to this point about the sort of the unique space that the Boys and Girls Club creates, you know, it's so different than a school setting where you're on a schedule, you're on a curriculum, you got to teach. Yeah. There's just the sort of luxury of time and space and just the environment itself lends itself um, to just creating more authentic relationships, whether you're, you know, shooting baskets around with a young person and just talking in a more authentic way um, or, you know, helping them with their homework. There's just, there's a, a, an environment that is, that is really conducive to building more authentic relationships. Yeah. And we have the benefit of just having employees, as I said, We've been in this work for years and we have a club director who's been in it over 30 years in the same club knows family yeah. and you know is leading you know children of her prior board member or prior members and that to me is that longevity um that you know, the relationships really can have an impact we had a an all hands meeting on today um where we had all of our employees on a, on a virtual meeting like this and we had one of our alums come back and just speak to us about his journey since he left the club. And he is now a junior at a local university and he is helping to lead conversations around race and equity with his university president and really championing as an agent for change in his community and in, in, in that uh, college. And what I watched that was so powerful is the number of people on that call who knew Corey and they, you know, were, were chiming in on the chat, Corey, I remember you were at the club and it was multiple people that he was reconnecting with in this moment. And it spoke to me about, these are people who authentically know this young man. And it's been years since he's been in a club and that's the power yeah. of relationships. Yeah, yeah, that's impressive. Um, early on in this uh, program, I uh, had a conversation with David Wilkinson, who is the president of the Atlanta Police Foundation. And he was very, very proud of an organization that you mentioned in your presentation, the at Promise uh, Centers. Tell us more about those. Because yeah. this whole policing issue is so important and how we've got to have more community police and people, police involved in the community. And this is an excellent way that, uh, that to do it. Yeah. So I, I had the opportunity to work with David um, when in my prior role at Atlanta Public Schools. And, and the vision for the original At Promise Center, originally it was, it was meant to be a diversion program. Um, for young people who um, were getting caught up in the criminal justice system, but really we wanted to find other avenues to help support them before they got their record, before they, you know, <laughs> to juvenile detention. Um, and so the At Promise Center was created as a place where the police could bring them, where they could get referred and have a variety of supports 
um, that included, you know, Chris 180, for example, a local organization that does a lot around mental health supports and wraparound supports for families. Um, the, um, there are several other organizations. Um, Raising Expectations provides academic support to young people. Um, there are job uh, training programs, GED programs for families, um, and a variety of other partners that I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, but the Boys and Girls Club is an important part of that to provide a space for mentoring and a space to connect young people with engaging experiences that I've described tonight. Um, and so the idea originally, as I said, was to be a more about diversion programs and where the police who live in that community, and the first one is over in the west side of Atlanta in the English Avenue community, where they've converted several homes um, that used to be, um, you know, torn, uh, you know, homes that were really in decline, they converted them to police housing. So across the street from the at, at promise line, they've allowed policemen to move in there. And the idea is that they come and they're supposed to mentor in the club and build, you know, more natural relationships with the kids and just to get to know them personally. Um, the second at promise center at, um, opened in the Metropolitan uh, Parkway area last, um, I guess, January or this past January. Um, so, you know, three or four months in, and we have a third one that's in the works down in the um, Campbellton Road area. Um, the model has evolved. We've been learning as partners in this work. And I think what we learned is that this doesn't need to be just a diversion program. So it is really an open community center for young people all yeah. over the community that yeah. can get there. Um, and it's a really promising model that we're continuing to refine, as I said, and, and hopefully um, continue to just, you know, impact more kids' lives as we grow it. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Um, and I certainly believe in diversion programs because we've got to do everything we can to get youngsters who are beginning to get off on the wrong track uh, back in. And I was also, English Avenue is one of the most, most difficult neighborhoods. Uh, they have more crime and, uh, and, and I, I, I would imagine the gang situation down there is pretty, is pretty rough too. So that was a, a very interesting choice to, to put your first uh, at Promise Center in, in English Avenue. I'm also impressed because uh, I was on David's board when he first came to Atlanta. And we talked about uh, finding housing for police officers. So that most of our police officers live uh, in surrounding counties and not even in the Atlanta area. And that's, that's unfortunate. So I'm yeah. delighted to hear, this is news to me, I'm delighted to hear that uh, we now have uh, housing uh, in, uh, in, in that area. So. Mm -hmm. David, once again, if there's a person watching today who wants to be part of the solution in terms of addressing issues of inequity in our communities, what specific advice would you have for them? How might the Boys and Girls Club of Metro Atlanta play a role in supporting someone who wants to give back? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I you know, I'll start by saying you have to do the work. Um, it's, you know, I, I was on a call recently with some of my colleagues as we were processing, you know, the recent verdict and just sort of how people were experiencing what's going on right now. And one of my black colleagues said, to the group that was, you know, a good mix of, of employees. I can't explain to another white person why this matters. I can't educate you any further. Please stop asking. Um, and what she said and charged us to do is like, you have to educate yourself. And so I thought about that. And, and how does a white person who needs to educate yourself, who needs to become more culturally competent, how do you do it? And, and I think that's the work first and foremost is to build authentic relationships with people who are different than you. Uh, particularly if you're a white person and you have lived in a bubble. Um, you know, I had the, the distinct, you know, privilege in many ways of, of growing up in a largely African-American community um, and have worked almost all of my life in largely black settings. And I still, from that experience, have so much to learn and I have people around me and, you know, my best friend in the world who always is challenging me. And, and I've grown so much through those relationships and learned, but I think just being in a journey and um, just leaning in to try to learn and listen as we've talked about tonight uh, is the first thing. And then I think just understanding your platform and you know, whether, whatever your role is in society, whether that's you know, a position you might have in, in your job or, or an opportunity in a community um, or, you know, perhaps you're a, a white male with privilege who has access to other males with privilege. 
Um, I think we all have a responsibility to figure out in our circle how we can have influence. And as my friend says often to me, please tell your people this. And I, I, I joke around with her that when we have our white conference call, I'll be sure to, uh, to share her feedback. Um, but, but in all jokes aside, I think this year has given me many opportunities as a white male to engage in some, some tough conversations with other white males. And that's an important part of the work because it's white people that really have to do a lot of this work um, ourselves to understand and, and to help uh, change you know, the community yeah. we live in. Well, that's why it's so important that you're taking this journey and that you're sharing your experience with us. I think your friend is absolutely right, and I never even thought of it that way, but she says, I can't tell him or her what, what to do. We have to figure it out for ourselves, but how can we figure it out for ourselves if we can't have these, these kinds of dialogues or journeys uh, like, like the one that you're, you're embarking on and you uh, elucidated so, so beautifully tonight? Many of us in this call are on the same journey at various stages of the journey. Uh, I don't know if there are any as far as advanced as you uh, and your and your colleagues, but it is an, an incredibly important important journey, and we're we're glad you're on it. You. David, I want to thank you again for uh, being with us tonight. Um, we appreciate all that you and your colleagues have been doing. Uh, at Boys and Girls Club, uh, and we want you to, uh, you have our very best wishes to keep up the, uh, uh, keep up that excellent work. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, uh, with the journey that you, you and your colleagues are, are taking. And I want to thank uh, uh, our listeners uh, for submitting questions and uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, we're going, I want to invite you to another uh, program next month, Challenging Racism in Atlanta. We're going to be presenting Carol Naughton, CEO of Purpose Built Communities, and we'll be sending you additional information uh, about that. Uh, so at this point, David, thank you again, and thank all of you for, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank, Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thanks, David.